Man? Okay. So, we are on behavior and last time we discussed individual behavior and today we are in group behavior. So, this is what chapter 10 is about. Chapter 10 is about groups and teams. We also call them groups and work teams. And it's basically understanding what these things do. Yeah, this guy will be waiting. All right, he's going to be waiting. All right, so define what a group means. So what is a group? And describe the stages of group development. So what is basically a group? And how the group evolves. How the group develops. It develops in stages. So we'll be discussing those stages. Then we go about major concepts of group behavior. So what is just the group behavior? What it is, how it works, what it does, and so on. And then how groups are tuned or turned into effective team. So what's the difference between just a group and an effective team? So essentially what's the difference between a group and a team? Okay? And effective. Remember, effective means getting the job done. That's lecture one, right? And last one is contemporary issues in managing teams. So first is define definition of groups and also some of the stages. All right, so definition of group, it's very simple. Two or more people working together for a common cause or a common reason or for a common goal, all right? So in this case, we can think of you as a group in the sense that you're all here to learn management. Now, when you have your exam, you have, in this case, it's not just a group, it's a team, a team of two people trying hard to get a good exam in order to get a good grade. Okay, so groups we define, unfortunately, PowerPoint not very good, it's missing a lot of stuff. Uh, the stuff which is not on PowerPoint will be on the exam, right? So, formal group. Formal group means the institution provides it as part of the organizational structure. It is part of the organizational structure. This is how the group is or, okay, it will usually have a lot of things like manager goes and all the other things. And you'll have an informal group. An informal group will not have any particular structure. It will not be structured. But nevertheless, it will be formed, okay? And sometimes groups can actually form based on friendship. They like each other. Or, as I mentioned before some time ago, uh, a group may form simply because all they like to talk about the stock market, so they're into investments. Or maybe a group will form because they're all into fitness and health. They all want to go to the gym and all the other things, okay? So they form a group who want to be, let's say, healthy or want to have big muscle, maybe. So these are informal groups. Uh, informal groups we sometimes call them and we are more appropriately call them social groups. Social groups. Alright? This is what you do when you go outside after class and have these so-called social activities, right? Social group could be, let's say, a band of musicians with the guitars or whatever that the music they're playing. So it's all groups which are social. So, we may have examples, and these are, again, formal. Keyword is formal work groups. You know, you're all experts in the informal group, but the formal groups are more interesting. That can happen at work. The formal group number one will be a command group. So, this is a group determined by the organization chart. Again, the keyword is organization chart, okay? So, they are part of the structure, okay, and composed of individuals 
who reports to a given manager. So you got the org chart, and they all report to one manager, to a given manager. All right. Now that's just a command. You may have a task group. Well, I actually sometimes they call it more like task force. Uh, honestly, I don't know the difference. Probably there will be some uh, management experts who can tell, oh, there's a difference between task force and task group. But here's what a task group is. Individuals, not necessarily on the same command, usually brought together for a complete, to complete a specific task. Usually they have a specific job. Sometimes we say they have a specific project to do. Uh, yeah, the task group here is, uh, let's say, we have, for example, final coming. And for the final coming, we professors must submit our final exam for approval. Well, they'll form a special group of professors, maybe three, maybe five, okay? And these five professors will review the final exam, and if they like it, and they say approved, or if they don't like it, they say rejected, we don't like this, this, and this, and you fix it and submit to us again, okay? So this will be a task group, and their task is to review the final exams for appropriateness, that the exam is good, the exam is hard, the exam is appropriate, okay? And once, here's the key, once the job is done, the group is dismantled, meaning the group does not exist anymore, and it will be maybe with other people reassembled next semester for the next midterm about two or three months from now, okay? So, you put them together, they get the job done, when the job is finished, everyone's back to whatever they were doing before. So that's a task group, okay? The key word is completing a specific job, specific job task, okay? Specific task, that's the key word. Get it done, you're done. Next one is cross-functional team. And they could, these could be actually longer term. Now, a task group, group could be also long term. For example, uh, you may have a pharmaceutical company, okay? And they say, okay, you're gonna try to develop a particular cure uh, or particular medicine with this idea made out of a particular, uh, you know, uh, let's say extract to cure, I don't know, pimples for teenagers, okay? And they could be working for one year, maybe two years. To, they gotta develop it, they gotta make it, then they probably gotta test it, okay? So some of these could be very, very long term, usually one, you know, as much as one or two or three years, okay? Now, the cross-functional is, you got somebody, and we did study this in structure, Somebody from accounting, somebody from finance, somebody from sales, somebody from marketing. So you got different people from different functional units and they all get together to do some common task, okay, or common job, whatever the job is. So in a sense, look, you gotta understand, all of these gotta do a job, okay? All of them gotta do it, and that's what it is work, it's a job, okay? So these are coming from different departments. Usually, some or quite often, you will also have the IT department, someone with a technology, okay? For example, when I was uh, uh, in, in, in the corporation, Sterling Commerce, I've mentioned before, we need to do reporting, okay? Well, we gotta get people from accounting, we gotta get people from finance, we gotta get people from sales, and we also gotta get people from IT. And all of us will work together so we can figure out what's in the accounting database, how do we get it, what is the type of report we need to do, how is the report gonna look like, in other words, what are we saying? 
the requirements for the report and then get an IT guide to help us do, you know, access the database, do the queries, and maybe possibly a reporting guide who will do the formatting. So I have a team of five or six people trying to do what we call a real-time report. In business, they call it a live report. Live report is you hit the button and you see instant data as it is on in the database. And all salespeople enter their data live as things occur, or the accounting department enters their debits, credits, and whatever information they get. All right, so that will be a cross-functional team. So I was, part of my job is to participate in many cross-functional teams. So I will be in the sales department. Within the sales department, I'll be in a special unit called sales support unit. So sales department will have 100 people, all right? They're gonna be into regions, and then within each of the regions, they're gonna have areas, and within areas, they're gonna have districts, okay? And you're gonna have about seven or eight uh, people who are sales support, whatever they need, whether it's IT or reporting or information or data or something else or materials, they'll be coming to our little team. So now I'd be in sales support, but I'll be uh, participating in maybe three, maybe five, sometimes up to eight different cross-functional teams, or I'd be in a couple of functional teams, maybe two or three functional teams, and I'll be in a couple of task groups. So I'll be working what we call projects. I'll be doing different projects. So in two cross-functional teams, I'll be doing two projects, and in two task groups, I'll be doing maybe two other projects. I'll have separate projects from my own manager, and maybe a separate project from the, uh, let's say, uh, vice president of sales. So I might be having six, seven, or eight different projects. And the idea was, I know what I'm doing and how I'm doing. I usually go to the boss, two things. When one, I have a problem and can't get, can't get something done. Or two, I go to my boss asking about prioritizing. Hey boss, I gotta work this, this, and this, but I don't have the time and abilities to work all three at the same time and get them done. Which is the most important I should work immediately as highest priority. So all I go is, let's say every Monday when we have a uh, team meeting, meaning uh, we all sit together and everybody tells to the manager who is doing what. Every time I tell them the same thing. This is the list of my projects and these are my current priorities. And he may tell me, oh, okay, move this to a higher priority or this is becoming very important and drop this priority lower. So basically all I need from him is to give me proper priorities. Well, I usually exercise judgment, but sometimes there are bigger corporate issues which I can't know and I don't have to know. It just doesn't look this is more important work on this focus on that. So that's cross-functional team. I've participated in a lot of them. And you also have self-managed teams. And self-managed teams, you know, they just get together, all right? They're independent. There is no formal structure. And again, in addition to their own tasks, uh, you know, they take on other managerial responsibilities. So you got a group of people, three or four, they're doing whatever, and somehow they will also go self manage, self-manage. They'll manage themselves. You don't need to have the company put in a project manager or a task force manager or a team manager. They'll just self-manage. When the groups are small, three people, four people, maybe five people, they can easily self-manage. When you have more than four or five people, then you someone to manage and to assign responsibilities and so on. All right, so that's pretty much what a group looks like. We got the stages 
oh no, concepts about, oh okay, group behavior, yes, concepts about group behavior, now this is PowerPoint, alright, so we continue with the stages, stage number one, and we're going to go through these now, they, they messed up PowerPoint, right? PowerPoint not good, number one is forming stage, Forming stage is the stage where the group is formed. Basically, you get the members together and these members get to understand why they are together and what they are doing. So, here you got basically people joining the group. You just join. You become member of the group, nothing special. And the second part here is you define the goal. Well, what is the goal? Why are we here? What are we doing? This means, what's the goal? What's the objective, you know? Now, some of these guys in the, in, 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 you know, the fitness room, their objective is bigger biceps, bigger muscle, or better health, okay? Well, here's what's the group, okay? Well, what's the purpose? And I just gave you an example. Purpose for that group I mentioned was to review that final exams match the requirements of the course, okay? And that the exams are good and appropriate for the level of this university. In other words, the exam must not be too easy and it can't be too hard, okay? Just like a meal, it can't be too cold and it can't be too hot, all right? So, you gotta see what's the objective and we need to understand what's the structure. Who is responsible for what and who's managing, in other words, leadership. So, let me repeat. Number one is joining, then purpose, structure, and leadership. So, that's the first stage for me. Second stage is called storming. Usually, not always, usually there will be little conflicts, okay? Well, conflict may be one member wants more, harder exam, okay? Another member wants the exam to be longer, okay? So, different people, when they get together, will have different ideas, different ideas. And when ideas are different, you will get a little bit of conflict. Well, doesn't mean they're fighting, okay? But there will be what we call disagreements, okay? Sometimes they like to use in business the word friction. There are friction, there are always frictions, especially at the beginning, until people learn each other and until get to understand what's really the common goal, okay? So, that's the storming stage, okay? There's also part of the conflict is, well, who's really the boss? Who's really the real leader? Because you may have a formal leader, but you may also have an informal leader, all right? Formal leader is someone who's supposed to be the boss, but you also have someone who's really the knowledgeable guy. Someone who's already been very, very experienced, maybe has been for 15, 20 years. Someone who has an outstanding reputation, all right? And someone who happens to be close to the boss, all right? And he's been there for 15 or 20 years. He wants to be in charge, but he's not in charge. So there's going to be some friction between the formal leader and the other guy who thinks he should be the leader, but it's not, so he likes to assume the position of informal leader. Alright? So that will be the storming stage. Norming stage means that the group will develop its own norms. Norm means appropriate, acceptable behavior. 
So appropriate, acceptable behavior, and again, which is expected from all the others, and which is expected from other members, all right? Like coming on time for the meeting, like discussing open, or openly or honestly or challenging each other. It depends on what the situation is. So this is the norming stage. Uh, this is where we say the uh, relationships, the uh, people form relationships between each other. They get close to each other. And maybe we need to write a word for you to translate. The group becomes, becomes cohesive. Cohesive. So, cohesive means that the group is tight. People have common opinion. They, you know, they can work together and maybe, let's try this word. They work together smoothly. And smoothly means without conflict, without friction. Okay? So that's the norming stage. Here you get common expectations you understand what's expected from you and at the same time you expect things from other people and everybody understands what's expected from them and what's expected from the others expectations are very 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 important early on when I was working here in my week three week four week five I had difficulties trying to understand what's exactly expected from me. You know, uh, I, mean, I expected to do this or that. Am I expected to give you an extremely hard exam? Am I expected just to give a free grade to everybody? Or am I expected just to fail every single student that is not good enough? Okay. So, am I expected to enforce strict discipline, meaning they don't come to class, we lock the door, right? Uh, and so, uh, I had hard times understanding exactly what the expectations are from me. Well, it happens for anyone who joins a group or who joins a team in this group or who joins a new workplace. In any time, what you need always to do in any type of group is always to set expectations straight and if some people don't like it they can say hey I don't like it or I don't agree with it or they just leave the group okay whatever the story might be so here you got the key word is friendship close relationships and then you got the performing stage and the performing stage is actually time or the stage when work gets done, okay, when people are productive, when they're doing what they're supposed to do, when they're doing what they actually got together to do, you know, they do the job and they get it done. And this is the stage where they're most productive, they are at the same time from chapter one. Very efficient and very effective. So here is where you get all the efficiencies, all the effectiveness, and all the benefits from the group. And okay, that's what it's all about. That's why they are together. And then you got a journey. And a journey is a little misleading. It actually means two things. It can mean to disband completely. It was a group and the group doesn't exist. And it's not likely to be set together. But it may be a journey. And to adjourn means you disband temporarily, but you know and expect that they'll join again later at the later stage. And that's the perfect example which I gave you about the finals. The group will get together, they'll review all the finals, they'll reject, approve, do whatever they're supposed to do, 
And when the finals are over or begin, the group is adjourning until the next midterms of the next semester, about two months from now. So up until that time, they, uh, again, they may be friends, they may talk, but they won't have any real work to do. They won't have any real meetings, they won't have any real stuff. And then it's possible that after the adjourning, when the next midterm comes, maybe one or two members will be out, and there may be new members coming in. So there's a new member coming in, you know, the member has to be introduced to the group, introduced to the goals of the group. Uh, he will have to be introduced to what's expected from all who are already present and what's expected of the new member of the group. In other words, the group will be formed again, but it will be reformed. Probably some members dropping out and new members uh, get in. So that's the uh, 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 journey part. It's essentially what's called wrapping up the activities of the group. It's like finalizing. You do final stages. Sometimes we like to say you just clean up the mess behind you. You know, you get the paperwork, you got the documentation, you file the documents, whatever it is, everything's set clean and good, and they can say to each other, Goodbye, see you, whatever, next semester. All right, let's see what else we have. Oh yeah, sometimes, sometimes, as the group evolves, it may regress. So, let me explain. This is called progress. Stage one, go to two, go to three, go to four, go to five. So, progress is moving forward. They may regress where, where you will have a group from performing as they do their job, they get into severe conflict and they switch back to storming mode. So as they're doing more and more work, you may have someone who's dissatisfied or someone who's not performing or they may be out of problems or, God forbid, they get sick. And suddenly the other people got to pick up the work or they got to get someone else. And when they get somebody else, you're back into the forming, storming stage. So as a work groups and evolves, they may actually shift one or two stages or phases back. And they got to rework. Of course, if they've gone through here in about two weeks, okay, then they go in two days here and then get back to stage three and four a lot more quickly. But the basic idea is that the group does not always move forward, which we call progress. The it may regress, okay, it may move back. So that's a possibility. And that finishes, that finishes uh, the section. Let's see what they got over here. All right, stages of group development, which we call the evolution, the stages. This is what I've been covering so far. And then I got group behavior. You know, they got these stupid PowerPoint slides. Let's see what's next. All right. <laughs> PowerPoint, not good, guys. All right. Uh, you guys want to take a break or continue? Continue. All right. Section number two is group behavior. In part of group behavior, number one concept is called a role. Everybody usually in a group of three or five or seven people has got a role, okay? And the role is behavior which is expected from you. What is it you're doing as part of the group, okay? Why are you part of the group? So how do you contribute? Now, in the cross-functional groups, it's very easy to see the role. The IT guy is, role is to provide IT support. Access to the database, the login, the password, the software, all the permissions, the security, whatever that might be, the networking stuff, all right? The role of the sales guy will be, I'm like a sales analyst, to tell what do we 
need to do? What does the report have, have to show? It's got to show by different region and by different product what are the sales currently for the month up to date. So up to date we want to see for each product group, we got four families of groups, and for each region, how each region is doing for each product. And say, well, what information do you need? Well, we need the cartel, we need this information, number of sales, we need the average sale size, we need, of course, the most important is the total number, what's the total, okay? And I just tell them what are we call the business requirements, the report requirements. What really needs to get done, okay? And then the finance guy says, okay, we have this information here, and we have this information here, and we've got this information there, okay? And then I got what's called the reporting guy. And the reporting guy will say, well, how do you want it? Do you want it page like this, which is landscape, or do you want it portrait? Well, what kind of table do you want? Do you want this type of table, that type of, type of table? Well, do you want any chart? Well, do you want a pie chart? Or do you want this chart or want that chart? Or do you want to have a chart and underneath the data? Well, how do you want the report to be format, the formatting part, all right? And then how do you want to access the report? It's going to be on the web, it's going to be how? Do you want to print it out for you every Monday, okay? Or uh, usually the big boss says, oh, no, no, I want to have a link, a shortcut on my desktop. I want to, you know, I want to say reports. When I double click on it, when I want to click, I double click, and it opens the report for me in real time, okay? And says I want to do this whenever I want to do this, whenever I want to check it. So, you get all of these requirements. So, the idea of that is that uh, each person has a specific role, and that role includes expectations, okay? What is expected from me? In other words, I should know what I'm expected to do. Now, sometimes a person in a group Uh, sometimes a person in a group may have what's called multiple roles. You may have two roles or three roles, all right? For example, you may have, let's say, the guys in the fitness, that's not a real job, you know, they're all trying to pump bigger muscles. And one of the guys may be, uh, let's say, a uh, part of the group doing whatever uh, things, but he may have a special role and expertise in Nutrition. I mean, should you eat three eggs or five eggs or seven eggs? Should you eat the eggs before the workout or after the workout? Well, should you eat them cooked? Should you eat them boiled? Should you eat them fried? Or should you eat them raw? And if you eat them, should you eat the white and throw the yellow of the egg? Or the opposite, you should eat the yellow and throw the white, okay? And if you have dinner, it's got a big steak. Should it be with rice or it has to be only with salad? In other words, you will have a guy who will do whatever is in the group, but he'll also be the expert on the, let's say, the expert on the food. And another guy might be an expert on some other type of exercise, okay? Some other guy might be expert on methodology. So, sometimes a person may have two roles, maybe three roles, maybe four different roles, okay? For example, if the group is doing something, they may have a role, somebody may have a counting member role or whatever, but he will also have the role of writing up the report, the final report for the group. Another one may have a role of documenting the activities of the group. Okay, so you could expect someone to have two roles, three roles, maybe more, four roles, okay? So you may have, well, you will have, as I explained, role expectations, and you may get what's called a role conflict. Role conflict usually means that someone likes a specific role and someone else wants the same role, and then they get to argue about that particular role. 
Or role conflict where, you know, uh, uh, someone says, oh, I got three roles and the other one got three roles and the other got one, two. And nobody wants to take this particular role. For example, you need someone to take notes of the meetings, okay? And someone has to do it, but nobody wants to do it, okay? So, what do we do? another role in here. We're a nice little group here, right? And we need all, well, usually the role of a camera girl, right? And nobody wants to take the role, right? We don't have, we don't have anyone to go on. So, we may get this little problem of, well, are you going to be on the camera or are you going to be on the camera? Well, in my particular case, I got two other solutions. Number one, I can just point the person, but number two, what we try to do is go rotate the role. Okay, well, he's done it three times, now you've done it, well, after the break we're going to get somebody else who did not do it before. Well, last time he did it, I remember. So, what we try to do is every person try to get the role of cameraman or camera woman, right? So, that's example of a role. Now, my role usually is to take right away. So, roles. Let's see what else we got. Next concept, so number one is role. Number two is norm. I already tell you a little bit about the role. These are the acceptable standards. So, this is the standard that are shared by the group members. Alright? So, norm. Here, we don't, you know, hit each other on, you know, with a hand on the shoulder. But, if we're in the gym, alright, and we're pushing and lifting up, you know, uh, you're, when the guy does 10 reps real hard, you say, good man, and you hit him on the shoulder, okay? It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's nothing wrong doing this in the gym, all right? In the gym, not here, all right? So, you have what is normal, comes from normal. What is normal? What is acceptable? What should be the behavior? We call it a standard, behavioral standard. Now, a typical norm here is that uh, students can be and shouldn't be, at least in academia, late more than 10 minutes per class. So, now, one way to enforce the norm is to lock the door 10 minutes after class. Right? So, that's an example of a norm. Another norm in this class is not to talk, okay? So, before, I just warned you, okay, no talking, no talking. Now we make more of enforcement. Okay, you guys separate, right? You guys separate. So I am developing also. Well, we know what the norm is. Well, you know what the norm is. We're trying to develop some enforcement. We call it discipline. All right. We're trying to enforce and actually, yeah. Everybody knows they shouldn't talk, but they just keep talking. So one way to do it is you guys separate. Everybody knows they shouldn't be made for class, but one way to do it is lock the door. This is enforcing the norm. Alright, so norms again, but in business type environment, they dictate what's the output level. They dictate the productivity. They dictate the requirements. Uh, they dictate a lot of things. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, absenteeism. They dictate, you know, how much you can be absent. They dictate the presence. Uh, they dictate uh, how much you can be late. All right. So they dictate the overall behavior, and which means two things: the things you should do and things you shouldn't do. Like it's a common norm here that we don't have students sleeping during class. All right. You can sleep during the break, right? And you just, okay, you just doze it, right? A little, like that. That's okay. All right, so, uh, what else? Other types of, uh, of norm include dress. Well, of course, we should have pants, but we 
can't really come with shorts to class, right? It's not the beach, right? It might be Phuket, but it's still not the beach. It's still our classroom, right? I mean, here we gotta have some sleeves at least, right? Here we got at least got a little bit of that. I mean, we can't just so same for uh, uh, same for students. You know, many of you will actually have to have a tie. I mean, that's part of the norm. Yeah, okay. Uniform is part of the norm. Uh, sometimes we call it. They usually in businesses to call it dress code. And dress code is how you are expected to clothed at work. Now, the difference between dress code and uniform is that uniform is uniform. It has to be white shirt, that's it. It has to be a skirt, no more than five centimeters above the knee, and right. And no more than five centimeters below the knee, so the skirt must be straight to the knee. Maybe five centimeters higher or lower, no more, no less. All right. So that's uniform. Uniform says these are the shoes that you have to have. All right. Well, in a dress code, you don't have, you don't get so specific. In a dress code, you say, well, you gotta have proper pants, or what we call in the business world, you gotta have khaki. Khaki. You will see what khaki means. Let's try and write it. But uh, most people will know. You will. Khaki. So they say, well, you gotta have khaki. All right. Uh, then they say, oh, you gotta have formal shirt. But sometimes they say, oh, you can have a what's called a golf shirt. A golf shirt. You know, almost everybody knows what's a golf shirt. All right. So khaki and a golf shirt. Okay. Well, part, of course, of the dress code, and there's no doubt about it, you gotta have socks. I mean, you can't come without socks. Well, guys must have socks. For girls, maybe, maybe not, right? Again, dress code will detail. It may say women must have, you know, closed toe shoes with socks. Or they say it's okay to have open toe shoes without socks. Okay. It will provide a detail, okay? But it will not take, tell that the color of the shoes must be black and all the other details. All right. So it provides a guideline without being very strict. Another part of dress code is must have had or cannot have had. All right. All of those little things. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, also, uh, loyalty. Usually, a group expects you to be loyal. It's part of what you're doing. And the key is. Part of the norms is effort and performance. Part of the norm is effort. The time of you know work you put in and performance, what you are actually doing. You know, what are the results? What is your let's call it contribution to the group? How you contribute, alright? The group must see you as productive member. All right. So uh, back to back to uh, dress code. Dress code could be formal. Formal means you have strict requirement with exact description of what must be. Or the call of dress code could be informal. And informal it provides a good degree of flexibility. All right. So, for example, they tell me here that it's a, for us professors, uh, we don't have to have white shirt, but it's nice. It's the preferred one, all right? So you'll see probably, probably half the professors giving, here having white shirt, okay? It's not strict required, okay? And it's not for us formal, but it's the preferred one. All right, you say, okay, no big deal. They will white, okay, I'll put on white. I mean, it doesn't matter to me if white's color, black or brown, it doesn't matter to me. So, they like white, okay, put white. Make them happy. All right, let's see what else we got. All right, next concept within the norms comes the next part. It's called pressure and group pressure. Group pressure usually means that 
Well, some people expect others and they push them to do. All right. It's actually, it's actually uh, in Asian culture and in Asian societies, group pressure is a lot more efficient and effective of uh, uh, achieving goals than discipline. You now, discipline isn't usually going to do. You know? uh, for example, uh, I can't really make anyone study accounting or whatever by telling them or by basically, uh, let's say, scaring them that they will fail with a threat. But it's a lot easier if you got a study group of three or four people who usually study together, that they say, okay, we gotta sit and prepare for management, and then it's, you know, and they get to force each other to do part of the work or to contribute to the work. So you go, you got what's called group pressure. And group pressure is when members of the group try to make someone do, someone from the group to do what they're supposed to do or to behave they're supposed to behave. So usually the, the, the group will basically, the threat is if you don't do this, you're going to be out of the group, okay? We're not going to be any more a member of the group. And for some reason that person wants to be or likes to be a member of the group. So that's group pressure. It's the threat of exclusion. And the key, or the general idea is called, let's write it out there, conformity. Conformity. To conform means that you are effectively forced to behave the way you're supposed to behave. Alright? So, uh, an example of conformity is you have all the guys, let's say six guys in the gym and they're all pumping iron, right? And they all do what's called the bicep curl. So, if everyone else is doing 10 repetitions, you're expected to do 10. You can't just do six, alright? You gotta do 10 because everyone else is doing 10, alright? And if everyone's doing three sets, you also got to do three sets. You can't just say, oh, I'm tired, I don't feel good. No, you came with us to exercise and to pump iron, okay, and to pump your muscles. You will do like everybody else, all right? So here you got what's called a group pressure. And even though the guy doesn't like it, he will do the last four repetitions because everyone is doing 10 and everyone is expecting you to do 10. Now, you may get an informal pressure, that's not in the workplace, where you guys go out drinking and everybody's doing three beers. You can't just do one, right? I mean, yeah, they say, no, 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 I'm driving the car, so, you know, you're not, you know, you will do only one because you're the designated driver. Or quite the opposite, uh, when you have a group of six or seven people and everyone's drinking and everyone wants to drink, they'll force one and say, no, no, you're not going to be drinking because you will be driving us back home, all right? So they'll put a pressure on that person not to drink and they'll be watching him not drinking, all right? Even though he wants to drink because he's going to be driving back. Of course, so he's going to have the role of designated driver, okay? You're going to, designated means he will know beforehand that he's going to be the driver and because he's going to be the driver, he can't drink, all right? So it spoils the party for him, but he knows he will not be next time, the next time somebody else will be the designated driver. All right, so group pressure conformity, we got this one. Next concept number three, yeah, we got a few more to uh, get finished. Next concept is called status. And status is how high or how low you are in the group and the respect that you get, you know, what kind of respect you get, all right? So this is the prestige that you get, prestige, all right, right? Prestige, prestige, 
Prestige basically means how much others respect you. Okay? Uh, let's say, so this is the prestige, your position in your rank, how high you are. Okay? How high you are. So that's the status. In a group, we have a status hierarchy. Okay? You got a little group, and one is the big boss, and then he's going to have two others around it. And then you have four or five followers. Okay? Sometimes we call them problems. Alright? So, you may have a status hierarchy or status structure within the group. That's perfectly normal. Okay? And status will obviously be a main motivator. Status provides the motivation for many people to get more respect, to get more of this, to get more of that, okay? Uh, where others will do what you know you want them to do. So a lot of times uh, status means a lot to the person, especially in a group, it can mean way more than money, alright? And you, especially as teenagers or close to teenagers, you understand even more your role when you have your little groups, you know, who's most respected, who's not respected, who's got a high status, who's got a low status. You as, especially as young teenagers or in, a, or in your early 20s, uh, more than anything you want and need status amongst your friends. Okay. And sometimes you may leave one group of friends and go with another just to gain a better status and more respect. Alright, let's see what else we have. Now, status will sometimes depend on your age, it will depend on your skills, it will depend on your knowledge, it will depend on your experience. But sometimes it will depend on your muscle. Are you a big guy or a little guy? Are you having big muscle or small muscle? Okay? It may also depend on your tone, on how you speak, okay? So on your behavior. So status can depend on a lot of very many things. Okay? Let's see what else we got. And next one applies to everything, to every group is size. So number four. So let, 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 re, let's repeat again from the beginning. Number one is roles and everybody in every group you got a role, that's number one. Number two is norms. You always got a norm and norms force everyone into conformity. So that's number two. Number three is status. Number three is status. Let's see if they got this stuff in the original conformity. Yeah, they just, <laughs> they just got this a status, right? Who's going to get the crown jewel, right? Whatever. So that's number three. And number four is group size. In group size, you'll have basically small groups, you have mid sized groups, you got large groups, okay? Uh, so, small groups are usually very, very, very efficient, okay? Large groups are usually good for diversity, okay? When you want or you need diversity, okay? And one key idea, of, which is part of the previous one, is in a small group, you don't have what's called free riding. Free riding is someone sitting in the group and doing nothing and trying to get the benefit out of the group. You all should be familiar here with free riding because we all do exams in pairs. And when we do exams in pairs, what really happens is someone in the team, because you're a team of two, could be a very good student and the other person could be not so good student and the one who's not prepared will free ride means he's going to get a free grade based on the better student all right so that's free riding is getting the benefit from the group without the necessary contribution all right that's free riding 
They call it also in social science social loafing. All right? You're trying to get something for nothing out of the group. So that's usually a problem. So the bigger the group, the bigger the problem of free riding and also of conformity. If it's a small group, it's very easy because everybody sees who does what and everybody understands everybody else's role and everybody else's expectation. And it's easy to enforce conformity and to get rid of free riders or to lower or eliminate free riding. Okay? Well, in our case, we eliminate free riding on the midterm where everybody's got to work alone. All right? And on the final. All right? And the last one is called, let me see if it's last one. Yes, last one, and we take a break. It's called group cohesiveness. Cohesive. Yes, I have already written it. Cohesive. And that's cohesive and cohesion. The degree to which group members are attracted to each other. So, the degree of attraction and lack of friction. In other words, lack of conflict. And the degree to which they share, that's the other key, the group goals. So, it's the attraction and sharing the goal. Okay? Sometimes they are very, very, very passionate about it, okay? Sometimes they're not. For example, we got a little group of Bulgarians here who we us meet in Hakon, okay? But we are not a cohesive group, okay? Yeah, we meet from time to time. Sometimes we talk, sometimes discuss, sometimes go to a bar, sometimes do drinking, all right, all the other stupid stuff that we do. But we are not a cohesive group because we don't have a clear goal. I mean, we get together because, you know, we can speak the common language, but we don't have a clear goal. We're not eager to meet every single week. Yeah, sometimes we meet, sometimes we don't meet, sometimes we like, sometimes we don't like, okay? Well, I'm tired, uh, you know. There is no real enforcement because there is no real cohesion in the group, all right? Now, if you got bodybuilders going to the fitness room, they may have a strong cohesion when there are four guys and the four guys says seven o'clock in the gym and work out 90 minutes, all right? You make 10 exercises, three sets, 10 repetitions, and that's that, okay? And they all, and part of the, the cohesion is everyone, when they go in, they step and see how much they gain, okay? They may, as a group, they may, as a group, even get a little a thing where they can measure their bicep and see if they're making any progress in terms of centimeters or inches, all right? So, you may have a very, very strong cohesion, all right? So, again, cohesion will, uh, will determine whether the group will perform well and meet regularly, whether, uh, again, whether people are committed to the goal will determine whether the goal will be achieved, all right? In our case, we don't really have a real goal. And if we don't have a real goal, of course, we're not going to achieve anything, okay? We're not going to be meeting on every Friday night. Yeah, but maybe we meet, maybe we don't meet, okay? So, group cohesion is very, very, very important. And let me see something uh, else. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, is whether, what's the type of goal? Whether the goal is good or not good, whether the goal is worthy or not worthy, uh, you will have different types of cohesion. Let me see what we have. Group size, group behavior. Okay, group size, group behavior. And that's group cohesiveness. Group cohesiveness and productivity. So, if the cohesiveness is high or low, here you got the cohesiveness. And here you got the alignment of group and organizational goals. 
So if you got a very high alignment with a high cohesiveness, you get a strong increase in productivity. All right. So yeah, very high alignment of the group. You got a very strong cohesiveness. Cohesiveness. You get a good productivity. Now, if you got a high cohesiveness, but you don't have alignment of group and organizational goals, in other words, they're trying to do something else, you actually have a decrease in productivity. So here the key is the following. You got a big organization, okay? And this big organization has got a big goal. And the big goal in, let's say, our university is education, all right? Now, if I have a small group of four other professors, and we, four other professors, focus on research, our research is aligned with the goal of the university, then if our group is cohesive, it means a high increase in productivity, all right? Now, if we, four professors, uh, we've got our goal, and our goal is go every night drinking at bars, right, and picking up girls, right, then <laughs> that's not good for productivity. It's not going to be good for our job, right? Same thing. we got four guys that all going every day in the gym. We all talk about the gym. We don't talk about work, really, okay? We don't really talk about It's not going to be good for the job or for the university. So, if we are forming a group, it is very, very important if our goals are similar to those of the organization, in this case, the university, are totally not related. So, going up and drinking every night not really goal aligned, that's what we call it here, aligned with the university. You know, drinking's got nothing to do with the university. And education. So, if we're a strong, cohesive group, it's actually going to decrease our performance, all right? So, instead of talking about research and student problems and how to improve student study and all the other things, we do completely other things. So, if you're aligned and cohesive, productivity goes up, but if you're not aligned but cohesive, productivity goes down. And then you got similar. If you're not cohesive but aligned, you will still get some increase, even though it's going to be small. And if you're not really aligned and not really cohesive, then it's going to be practically have no effect on productivity. Whew, take a 